Good morning. First uh, Corinthians chapter three. I do want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Mothers have an important role in this thing, but I think all women and all men need to get back to the book and to their God-given duties. Amen. Women have a very important role. Uh, the book of Proverbs says that the law of a mother will be a crown of grace to the son. Right? He says, forsake not the law of thy mother, nor the instruction of thy father. Right? Uh, women, women lay the law for a son. They're very crucial in the upbringing and the foundation of a son. And the, the father's job is to instruct that child. But, but women have a very important job. And uh, Proverb, Proverb said, a man with a virtuous woman is the praise, that that man is praised in the gates, right? And what he's praised for is by how his house is ran by the, by the woman, amen? And America don't understand this stuff anymore. You got, you know, men running around with lipstick on now and uh, uh, women, women taking steroids and trying to be men and all this stuff, and it's just a just a nasty, filthy society. Amen. Amen. Pastor, I want to say something. Uh, yesterday, I went to take my nails done, and this guy comes in, and he's got a young boy, and he said, how long will it be since you put uh, nails on, artificial nails on you? Yeah. <laughs> Something, man. But in First Corinthians chapter three, Wednesday night I talked a little bit about this in the book of Romans, about the foundation of our faith and the four cornerstones in the book of Romans. And uh, this morning I want to start expounding upon these things a little bit more. First uh, Corinthians chapter three. Beginning in verse 9, Paul says, For we are laborers together with God. That means God's doing something. Amen. That means God is performing a work today. Right? And Paul said that he was a laborer together with God in this work. Well, what is the work? You're God's husbandry. God's growing something. Right? You read over there in the book of Ephesians and Paul Paul talks about the whole building, fitly framed together, groweth. Mm -hmm. Y'all ever seen a building grow? Must be a living building, Bill. Yeah. It's what Paul calls it in 1 Timothy, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. And so Paul, Paul says here that ye are God's husbandry. And so we're laborers together with God. In this growing process, God is growing something to bring forth fruit unto himself. Amen? Yeah. Then he says, ye are God's building. Right? Now notice Paul says, when he says he was a laborer together with God, notice that there's a colon after he says that. For we are laborers together with God. So that thought is picked up on in verse 10. The, the husbandry in the building is Paul explaining the work. Verse 10, he's picking back up on the thought that we are laborers together with God. Now notice, notice what made him a laborer. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me. Right? What made Paul a laborer in God's work was the grace that God had given him. We're going to see this in Romans chapter 1 where he says we received grace and apostleship. Right? But Paul was given something by God. This grace was given unto him by God. And the grace that God gave Paul was given unto him as a wise master builder. Right? God, wants, God is building something today. And he imparted grace to a man. And that grace made that man a wise master builder in God's work. And he says, by this grace... By this wisdom given unto me, I have laid the foundation, right? And another man, and another buildeth thereon, building on that foundation. But let every man take heed, 
Boy, you talk about a verse that's went unheeded. Right? A man is to take heed how he buildeth upon this foundation. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul had laid this foundation, and no man can lay any other foundation than what Paul had laid. Amen? And so it's important, number one, number one, it's important as labors together with God to understand the foundation Paul's laid so that we can build upon that foundation. A lot of people are not building on, the fa- on that foundation today. Yeah, you're right. They're building upon other things, yes, sir. right? Yep. And it's important for us to understand the foundation for the purpose of establishing people on that foundation so that they can be built up in Christ, right? Now, folks, I want you to know that I'm a Bible believer. I'm a Bible believer, man. I'm not a, I'm not, I don't consider myself anything else other than a man living by faith. And when I say I live by faith, it means that I live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. And I believe if, if, if our God and the Lord Jesus Christ says man lives by every word that proceedeth out of his mouth, if that's the case, to not give us every word would be unrighteous. Amen? And so when I say I'm a Bible believer, man, I, I mean I believe the book that I hold in my hands is the words of God. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right? I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. Amen? Amen? I believe this book. And I, when I say I believe that book, that doesn't mean that I think I can improve it. Yeah, right. I don't believe it can be improved. I believe God's words are pure words. I believe if you change those words, you corrupt the word of God. I believe they're pure. I believe every word of God in the Bible is is perfect, chosen for a reason. It's in its right order. You shouldn't restructure it. I believe all the punctuation in the Bible, Bill. I believe the question marks and the colons and the semicolons. And I believe all the punctuation in it, right? And I also believe, I even believe in the numerics of this book. You know, these people, these people are like, well, the chapter and verse markings were, were added later. I'm so tired of people thinking God died with the Apostle Paul. <laughs> yeah. Amen? Like God just quit. I'm done. Not doing anything else. My apostles are dead, you know. Yeah. I've seen too much strange phenomenon in the chapter and verse markings of the, king, of, of the Bible to, to, not, to say that there's nothing to it. Amen? It's like we was talking about this morning. Romans is the sixth book of the Bible. Adam was created on the sixth day. Man is synonymous with the number six all through that Bible. When the man of sin shows up, what's his number? 666. Right? Romans is the sixth book of the Bible. It's about God's gospel to mankind. Right? The word, the word man is the sixth word in Romans 2.1. It's the sixth word in Romans 2, 3, and it's the sixth word in Romans 2, 7. And when you come to the sixth chapter of the sixth book and come to the sixth verse of that chapter, man is the sixth word, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Right? I mean, you, you can't go ahead and think there's nothing to that stuff. But when I say I believe the book, I also believe the order that the books are in, right? I believe God put the books in the order he wants us to have them. For example, Paul wrote Romans right before he went to prison, right? This is one of the, this is one of the later epistles of, you got Paul's prison epistles. Romans was the last book Paul wrote as a free man before he went to prison. Right? Why does it show up first? The Bible's not in chronological order. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians was the first epistle he wrote. And it shows up at the end of his church epistles. Right? Galatians was written soon after that, around Acts 18. And it's, it's, it's the fourth book. What determined the order of the books? God did. They're in, or, they're in the order he wants them to be in. You see, because those epistles, that ain't all Paul wrote. 
But that's all God wanted preserved for future generations. Right? So you have to understand when you're reading those epistles, that is God's preserved epistles of his apostle for us. Right? And so when Paul says here, in the order of the books, when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that he had laid the foundation, where does that refer you back to? It would have to refer you back to Romans. You know, I don't think we're just reading some historical thing there, Bill, about when Paul went and preached to the Corinthians. I believe it's to us, and it's letting us know that prior to Paul to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul had already laid the foundation. And that foundation is in the book of Romans. Amen? Amen. Y'all follow that. Y'all on page with me on that, right? And so God placed that epistle first, the book of Romans, because it contains the foundational truth upon which we must build. If a man is going to, now I want you to see the error of this stuff. If a man is going to build with God today, right? Paul said he had laid the foundation and no other foundation can any man lay. If you're not building upon that foundation, your building is in vain. Right? Now, how many people are building upon that foundation? There's very few. Right? Very few. I I can promise you right now that I've seen it, I hear it, I've watched it, and very few people even understand uh, the, the foundational truths that are laid out in the book of Romans for us to be established upon. And if we are not established upon these truths that I'm going to talk about this morning, then the edification of the believer will suffer and fail. You do not build a house without a foundation. Right? Even Christ talked about this in in his earthly ministry. Right? He that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon the what? Rock. And then you have other men who build their house upon sinking sand. That house cannot stand. Amen? A man, listen, Kenny, you build a house for years, brother. You know, you know the first step is a foundation, right? That's, that's not complicated, right? You, you first have to have a foundation. And so the book of Romans appears first in these epistles because God is not sloppy in what he does. He put Romans there for our benefit. And we have to be built upon that foundation. And if we're not ever established upon this foundation, we're never going to be edified and grow up in Christ. Amen. Look at Romans 3.21. Give you some examples. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Right? Look at verse 24. Being justified how? By what? Through what? Right? Look at verse 28. We conclude that a man is what? Well, there goes the free wills. There goes 80% of Methodists. Amen? Point I'm making, that is a foundational truth. And if you're not established upon that foundation, folks, you know where you are? You're back in Romans chapter 1, 1 through 320. You're either a pagan Gentile corrupting God through your imagination, or you're some man claiming that you're making your boast of the law while transgressing the law. That was Jew and Gentile. What, cha- what Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 is about is Paul proving both Jew and Gentile that they're all under sin to bring them to the righteousness of God which is without the law. Right? The majority of people sitting in church buildings today have not even come to the first foundational truth of our faith and that is the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It's dangerous. Israel was ignorant of that righteousness. And you know what it led them to? Apostasy and blindness. Right? Look at, look at Romans chapter 5 or 6. Romans 6, 14. Establishment. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the what? But under what? You know how many Christians don't even understand they're under grace. Now they've been saved, right? They're not, they've accepted the first principle of the book of Romans, right? Justification by faith. But then they try to live this law out as if there's somebody as if God saved them and then put them back under the administration of the law. Right? They don't understand the new program because we have a new identity. The law was given to administer death to sinners. You're not a sinner. You've been made righteous through the, through the shed blood, the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have a new identity in Christ. And having this new identity, God has removed you, put you in his son, and then gave you a new administration of grace. And through that administration of grace, you are receiving of the life of Jesus Christ. Grace now reigns through righteousness unto eternal life. All right? Boy, are they ignorant of that one this morning? Romans eleven twenty five. 25. I'm giving you some examples of the modern church not being established upon the foundation. Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I would not, brethren. You see, with the, first, with the first cornerstone of the foundation, we knocked out a big chunk of them, right? We knocked out the Catholics. We knocked out anybody who thinks they're justified by works. Yeah. The second cornerstone, we knocked out another big portion of them. Those who are justified by faith, but now made perfect by the flesh. They don't understand the administration of yeah. grace. Now we're getting ready to knock the rest of them out. Romans eleven twenty five, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant concerning this mystery, that blind, that lest you be wise in your own what, wise in your own conceits. That's where the most of them are. They're wise in their own concept. They're wise in their own imagination. What Paul's explaining in Romans nine ten and eleven is the wisdom of God. Look at look at verse look at verse thirty uh, verse thirty three. Oh, the depth. Both of the what? And knowledge of who? God. Right? Paul is laying out for you the wisdom of God in his elective purposes. Right? Elect grace is something God elected to do. It's not something man earned. It's not some man, man ran for. It's not something that man willed. Who hath been God's counselor? Right? God determined this. When we read Ephesians, we're going to realize that this election of grace was something God predestined and foreordained before the foundation of the world. Right? And it was according to his wisdom, having made known unto us the mystery of his will and how God hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Right? If you don't understand the, the elective purposes of God in dealing with Israel and the Gentiles and this special dispensation of Gentile grace at this present time kept secret since the world began. You know what you're going to do? You're going to run around wise in your own imagination pretending you're a spiritual Jew or you're, you've replaced Israel and all this other stuff and you're going to be completely ignorant of the will of God. Amen. Right? Boy, they miss this stuff, man. They miss it. Look at Romans 12, 1. A man's reasonable service. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Well, guess what? If you miss the first three, if you miss the first three cornerstones, Paul is pleading with them 
by their understanding of what he has said up to this point. He said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Right? God doesn't want your money, folks. Now, it takes, listen, it takes finances and it takes money to do the will of God. Amen. Right? And God, God but listen, God, you know what God told Israel one time? They kept bringing them sacrifices. He said, what, you think I'm hungry? He said, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. All those things are mine anyway. Right? Listen, God doesn't, God doesn't want any of that stuff. You know what he wants? He wants your body to be something that he can feel. With the knowledge of his will. Because as we're filled with his wisdom and knowledge. We are glorifying him. What's missing in this world folks. Is the glory of our God. Man has corrupted him. You know how Romans began? With man corrupting the glory of the uncorruptible God. You know how Romans ends? To God only wise be glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? And God wants us to be, to be, to present our bodies a living sacrifice to him so that he can fill us with this knowledge and this wisdom that we may glorify him. Amen. Amen? That he may glorify the name of his son in us and that we may be glorified in Jesus Christ in him. Right? These are, these are foundational principles. I hope you understand that. And the majority of Christian churches today, when you read Romans, if you read and understand Romans, you're also going to know and understand that the majority of Christians today are playing. They're just playing. Right? And, and the reality is, listen, here's the, here's the facts. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. A man cannot be built up until he is first established upon the foundation. Our, our primary purpose in the ministry is to, first, is to get people saved and to get them established upon the foundation. That's the first work. If a, man can't, if a man's not established upon that foundation, you cannot build him up. He's got to first be established. Look at, look at Ephesians 2.20. And are built up. You see that? And are built up on the what? There it is. Right? You can't, you can't be built upon anything until you're first established upon the foundation. Look at what he says in verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. Look at, look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. If, if, <laughs> what's that word mean? It means it's conditional. Colossians 1.23, I didn't give you all the verse, did I? Colossians 1.23, if ye continue, right? Continue in what, Paul? The faith. Where are you going to find that? <laughs> Amen. What seminary? <laughs> right? Church constitutions? Tradition? You know, my Lord and Savior said, well, he was on this earth that man had made God's word without effect by their tradition. Right? I guess we think that was just a Jewish problem, though, right? Gentiles don't do such things. Gentiles were given a warning not to act like that Jew. 
that God had dispensed grace to us and his goodness would continue with us as long as we continued in his goodness. But if we followed Israel's example of unbelief, he'd also break us off. Right? You can't reject the book and just come to church and dunk people in water and partake in things you yourself have not studied nor understand. And think that you're somehow some, some type of pleasing thing to God. Look at Colossians 1.23. If ye continue in the faith, get the next three words, grounded and settled. Let's see, what do you think he's talking about? Paul's talking about your perfection. From back in verse 22. About the day that you're going to be presented to God the Father. Amen. He reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If, that's a big if, we are going to be presented to God regardless of what any man says. Right? Some are going to be found holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Others are not. What determines it? Well, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, God's going to do his work. It's a work of God. We're laborers together with him. And through the administration of God's word, there's a work of faith being done in the believer. That if he continues in the faith, God is going to do his work. God is faithful, Bill. The good work which God hath begun, he will perform into the day of Christ. And that work is a work of faith. But if you don't continue in the faith, guess what happens? The work ceases. Right? And so what do you have to be if you continue in the faith grounded and settled? That's talking about being established upon the foundation. Look at Colossians 2, 7. <laughs> Rooted. Rooted. Listen, we all know that before you can grow a plant, it's got to be rooted. Right? That there's not a person in this world that thinks that you, you just go outside and, and without rooting a plant, you can't skip the process is what I'm saying. If you're going to bring, if you're going to grow something and have it produce fruit, the first step is rooting that thing. Did Paul say we were God's husbandry? What's the first step? Rooting. Right? Grounding. Settling. Establishing. Foundation. But then he says rooted and built up in him. Established in the what? Abounding therein. In what? The faith. With thanksgiving. Right? Beware lest any man spoil you. Right? And so, and so there has to be, before there can be a building, there must be a foundation. And you must first be grounded and settled upon that foundation. Do you understand the book of Romans now? And why it's first in Paul's epistles, right? Look back in Romans chapter 1 now. The word of God is so perfect, man. The first, verse in, the first sentence in Romans goes from verse 1 halfway through verse 7, right? Now, Paul, the first, the sentence begins, Paul, and it ends to all that be in Rome. You see that? Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, Right? Meaning Paul was called by God and Jesus Christ to be one who he sent. Now, look in verse 7, there's his audience. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? So the called apostle was sent to speak to all that be in Rome, called, beloved of God, called to be saints. Right? Right? So there you have the author of the epistle and the audience of the epistle. 
In between those two verses is the message of that author to that audience. It is a message concerning God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm so sick of Christless churches, Bill. I am. Joel Osteen. That is a Christless church. Amen. A man whose eyes are on Jesus Christ doesn't talk about the things of this world 24-7. Yeah, there you go. If he's risen with Christ, his affections are on things above and not on the things of the earth. Because yeah. he's dead and his life is hid with Christ in God. But I love that phrase there. Look in, look in Romans 1, 3. Concerning. There's six words now. His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The middle two words is Christ Jesus. On either side of that phrase is who Jesus Christ is. He's God's son and he's our Lord. Amen. Amen. This is God's message concerning his son who whether man likes it or not he's made our Lord. Amen. Man don't have to accept that but he's still the Lord. That's right. Unto this end he both died and rose again Bill that he might be both Lord of the dead and living. Amen. Jesus Christ is God's son and he's our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the apostle was sent. The audience, the purpose of this sending was to deliver to the audience this message. Look what he says in Romans 1.5. I'm going somewhere with all this, folks. Is we're going to use both, lessons, both services this morning. Look there, look there in Romans 1.5. By whom... By Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. <clears throat> you see, we talk a lot about learning how to live under grace. And a lot of the times I just assume people understand how they do that. Right? Because of a verse, a, very ver a verse that most people have memorized. By grace are you saved through what? Faith. How does faith come? Hearing by the word of God. How do we live under grace? By faith. How do we have faith? Hearing the word of God. Do you realize the book of Romans? You pick that up. Hold it in between your fingers. How little. How insignificant the world thinks it is. But you know what the book of Romans is? That's the grace of God. Right? And until man learns to value those things more than the carnal things of this fleshly world, he will never live under grace. Amen, folks. Come on, don't leave me now. Say amen, preacher. Amen. Even if it cut, even if it hurt a little bit. Right? That's truth. Right? Man, man, man can't talk about being spiritual and and, and, you know, talk about the, the, the whole world. You know, we sing amazing grace and wonderful grace of Jesus. And there's churches that use biblical words like grace. But if you could, if you t ask them, show me the grace of God. I just showed it to you. I gave you something tangible. And I'm not talking about something out here floating around in the world. Some little pixie dust of grace that God sprinkles upon you to make you feel better and to give you goosebumps and to give you emotional experiences. I gave you something tangible. The grace of God is there in the book of Romans. It was given to Paul. Paul said, by Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. So here's what Paul's saying. By, by Jesus Christ, Paul had received grace and apostleship, 
meaning he had been sent out. Without that grace, there was no apostleship. In Ephesians, he said, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me. Right? Paul was made a minister according to this grace that had been given to him. Now he was given this grace and given apostleship. This began in Acts 13 when the Holy Ghost said, Separate Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I have called them. Right? What, what happened after that? They went. They went into Cyprus and then went up in, into Cilicia and preached in Lystra and Derby and, and then they come back and then later on they go up into, up into Galatia and Macedonia and Achaia. Paul spent the rest of his life after Jesus Christ gave him this grace, he spent the rest of his life going out and declaring the testimony of Jesus Christ to mankind. Amen. Right? What did God give this grace and apostleship to Paul for? Verse 5, Romans 1, 5. For, the, for obedience to the faith. What do you think this was about then? This was to make known to all nations the faith. The faith. We're not talking about your faith. Man believes some off the wall stuff, man. Right? We're talking about the faith that was revealed by God through this ministry to all nations. Right? Now come to Romans 16. I want you to get it, man. The faith. So the first chapter of Romans mentions obedience to the faith. See that definite article? Right? You, if, you, if, you remove, if you remove that right there, that becomes generic. Mm -hmm. right. right? It's not defined. When we call it a definite article, it means it's defined. The faith is a defined faith. It's not subjective. It's not according to how you feel. Right? Let God be true and every man a liar. If some does not believe, does that make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. If every denomination of Christianity is preaching something different, does it make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. They're liars. God is true. We're talking about a defined, definite faith. Look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish. Right? Remember what we were talking about earlier about having to first be established upon the foundation. Well, if Paul now says at the end of the book, right, God has the power to establish you, he must have laid the foundation. And this is confirmed for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 when he says, I have laid the foundation. Right? Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of who? Everlasting, Everlasting God. You want to obey God? Do you want to be obedient to God? Well, there's a commandment of the everlasting God. And it was made known to all nations. To all nations. Amen. Not just Israel. Made known to all nations. For the obedience of what? Not to and not the. It's made known for the obedience of faith. 
The faith mentioned back in Romans 1 is what Paul was going to make known. And what he made known was made known for the obedience of your faith. Meaning, now let me show you this. Meaning, if your faith is not in the faith that's been made known, you today are in rebellion against God. That is the commandment of the everlasting God. Right? Now before a man, I want you to get that, Romans 16. Before a man can ever be obedient through, through the obedience of faith, before he, can, before he can be obedient and show obedience of faith, the faith must first be made known. Amen. Made known. Do you know what that means? Faith is made up of knowledge. If something's not made known, there can be no obedience of faith. Before faith can come, man must first hear by the word of God. Paul said, I planted. Apollos watered. God gave the increase. Right? Right? So let, 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 me, let me put this in perspective, all right, because I grew up in southern West Virginia, man. They, they thought, I mean, there's some quack jobs down there. Hate to put it like that. But they thought church was something you just did. You didn't even need this. We're just going to let God lead, you know. We're going to let God have his way, you know. And after a show of flesh for about an hour and a half, Everybody in the church has a song and everybody in the church gets to stand up and testify and their testimony is not about Jesus Christ. It's just them bragging on themselves for an hour. Right? After all that, after all that, the Bible's never even open. They cut, get up and say, we had such a spiritual service tonight, we're not even going, we're not even going to preach. Right? And then we, we wonder why the church is in the condition that it's in. Amen. Listen, there can be no faith. Faith and ignorance are contrary to each other. God made something known for the obedience of faith. Meaning, this right here is impossible in a state of ignorance. It just can't happen. You can go around saying, I believe all you want to. What do you believe? Yeah, yeah. Amen? Yes, sir. God made some things known. Specific things. It's defined. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled. If you're not in the faith, you have no hope of being built up in Christ. So it was made known for the obedience of faith, right? And so, and so without knowledge, there can be no real faith. Real faith cannot exist in a state of ignorance. In the book of Romans, between Romans chapter 3 and chapter 11, Paul uses the phrase, God forbid, ten times in nine chapters, right? And it always follows a question. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. You know why? You know when he's using that phrase, is the law sin? God forbid. Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Do you know when Paul uses that phrase, and this, this is what we're talking about with this. When Paul uses that phrase, God forbid, in the book of Romans, you know what he's doing? He's correcting your bad thinking. God forbid you to think like this. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. 
He doesn't want you thinking like that. He's correcting man's mind to bring him into obedience of the faith. Right? Did God cast away Israel? God don't want you thinking that. You know? And I'm going to tell you something, man. I'd be careful thinking things that God forbids you to think. I, would forb- I mean, I would be careful with that. You know, what, you know what we call that? Paul said, the weapons of our warfare. There's a war taking place. He said, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, here it is, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. When Paul says, God forbid, that is a powerful weapon of God to cast down something in your mind that exalts itself against his knowledge. And it brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. The Word of God is a powerful book, folks. Powerful book. It's a book that can bring man into absolute obedience of faith. Right? But you have to receive the knowledge. Amen. And so the book of Romans is the faith that's been made known for the obedience of faith. Right? It is written and preserved for our establishment. Right? It was written to all that be in Rome. Right? Well, you have to understand Rome at that time. That's the capital of the world empire, man. Basically, it's almost, it would be almost like saying, hey, this is to the whole world. Beloved of God, called to be saints. You know, as Paul's letters progress, they get a little more defined. The saints at Ephesus to the faithful in Christ, right? By the time you get to the end of his epistles, he's writing individual men, right? The majority of, the majority of people that are saved are stuck back there in Corinthians and Galatians. There's a few that's come through the process and are now considered his own sons that he writes specific instructions to on how to minister the word of God, Right? But it gets more defined as you progress to all that be in Rome. Corinthians, with all that in every place, call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it gets specific, the Galatians. Then then to the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ. Then to the saints at Philippi with, with, with the bishops and deacons. Right? It's getting more defined as you progress. Right? You've got to progress through the epistles. There's something taking place there, and the book of Romans is the first book, and it contains the faith that God has made known for for the obedience of our faith. We must be established upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 and 11, look at it. Romans 1 and 11. For I long to see you. Who was that man? Remember that was that man that was sent out by Jesus Christ. Remember? And he longed to see him. You know Paul always wanted to go to Rome. But up to this point he had been let hitherto. Up to this point he had been let. He had been hindered. Because he was a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. God wanted this made known unto all nations. But Paul wanted to see him. And I'm thankful, Bill, that God in his infinite wisdom said, just write him a letter instead, and then you can go see him later. God in his wisdom was having Paul write these things to them in a letter for our establishment. He says, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You see, the purpose of the imparting of the gift was not for tongues or for signs or for wonders. And Paul had received something that he now wanted to impart to the Romans. 
and what it was, what was it Paul had received by, from God to impart to these Romans was for their establishment that he may be comforted together with them by the mutual what? Faith. What Paul wanted to impart to these Romans was what God had made known for the obedience of faith. Right? Paul was not happy until everybody that he, he knew and loved and everybody that had believed on Christ, Paul did not rest. He, he was in a constant battle and a constant struggle to bring all believers into the mutual faith. To perfect what was lacking in their faith. Right? Through the knowledge that God had given him. So what do you think Romans is written for? You think it's written for the establishment? Your establishment? In what? The faith. In the knowledge of God. Amen? And it's written for our establishment and for our continued edification. You can't continue in edification until you're established upon the foundation of Romans. You can't continue in edification. And through this establishment and the continued edification, we are perfected through the work of faith. The work of faith is godly edification. You know what Paul's going to write in the book about godliness, 1 Timothy? Right? We can't talk about godliness, Bill, until we get through the nine church epistles. Without what's in those nine church epistles, there is no mystery of godliness. Amen? Holding the mystery of the faith and a good conscience. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Right? Those nine church epistles contain the doctrine of godly edification that leads to the mystery of godliness. Its foundations are laid in Romans. Its pillars are built up in the book of Ephesians. Its walls are built in Colossians and Philippians. And the roof is put on in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then when you come to 1 Timothy, Paul talks about the church of the living God, which is the house of God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Right? You think Paul was building something in them first nine epistles? I know he was. I know he had been given the grace to build. And so Romans, what is it? It's the foundation. Right? See, I gave you something tangible. I gave you something you can understand. I gave you something that's going to work. I promise you if you ground yourself in the knowledge of Romans. If you establish yourself upon those foundational truths. You get, you get this second cornerstone of our faith. The administration of the grace of God. Right? If you live. Rooted and grounded in the knowledge of God's grace through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right? These preachers ain't going to be able to toss you to and fro anymore. Amen. You're going to laugh at them. You're like that guy don't have a clue what he's talking about, does he? Right? You get, you get established in the dispensational knowledge of God in Romans 9, 10, and 11. No man's going to be able to mess you up concerning the day of the Lord and all this stuff written in prophecy. Amen? Understanding the foundation. Romans, we got just one or two minutes here. And we're going to pick up with this in the morning service. Folks, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is important stuff. Amen? Amen. Very crucial stuff. The book of Romans has four cornerstones. I've only got two of them up here because I needed the room. But this foundation that we are built upon has four cornerstones to it. Right? Those four cornerstones make up the entire foundation of our faith. Right? Later on, Paul comes over in Ephesians. 
And he starts placing pillars upon this foundation that are designed to build us up. Right? He's building upon this foundation truths that are established upon that foundation. What God or Romans chapter 1, the mystery of God's will, right? Together all things in heaven and earth in Jesus Christ. You know what that's built upon? That's built upon the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel of Christ. Without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Bill, there is no gathering together of all things in heaven and earth. Colossians chapter 1, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things. You see, he's building greater truths upon that foundation. If you're not established upon the foundation, you can't get the pillars that are built upon yeah. that foundation. Amen. Right? And so, Romans has four cornerstones. We're going to start looking at these. The first cornerstone we're going to look at this morning in the morning service is this one right here, and then we'll pick up from here. The first cornerstone runs from Romans. Romans 1, you can say verse 14, into 511. And what that cornerstone is about is the right, I'm just going to put the righteousness of God. You want to know the importance of that cornerstone? You want to know the importance of it? Israel was ignorant of it. Look what happened to them. It's important. You don't have anything to stand on or anything to build upon without that. Where's that righteousness of God revealed? I know what man done with God. Right? We're going to read about it in chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You know what ungodliness is? It's man corrupting God in his imagination. You know what the antidote of that is, Bill? The righteousness of God revealed by the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith of Christ is the antidote of man's ungodliness. It is the faith of Christ that brings us a true knowledge of God. Man's ungodliness degraded man into unrighteousness. The faith of Christ and them that believe have now been justified and made righteous through the knowledge of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Right? We're going to look at this foundation. Amen. The first section is about the righteousness of God. The second section is about the grace of God. Without this, there is no grace. Grace reigns through righteousness. And through the righteousness of God that came by the faith of Jesus Christ, grace now reigns through that righteousness unto eternal life for all that believe. Right? So we're going to look at this, the righteousness of God, the grace of God, the wisdom of God, and the mercies of God in these four foundational cornerstones in the book of Romans. And uh, we'll pick up here in the morning service. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the many blessings of life. God, I just thank you for the great faith that's been delivered to us, Lord. As Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, uh, after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Lord, I thank you that through the faith that's been revealed, I've now received the spirit of adoption. And through that faith, God, you, you, are, you are growing me and transforming me into a son of God. And Lord, I just, I just thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for the, the great wisdom and knowledge contained in your word. And, but more importantly, Father, I'm thankful for your spirit. That enlightens us and reveals to us these great truths, Lord, that, that we can understand these things and have our minds renewed into spiritual minds that, uh, uh, that are led by you and directed by you, Lord, that, 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 that we may be transformed into the image of your Son. God, I pray for each and every person here. I pray, God, that you would open their eyes, help them to understand these things uh, uh, more fully, God, and 
I pray that you'd give me better understanding of these things, Lord, but I just pray that you would establish us upon these foundational truths. Build us up in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, that we may become a, a people that are, that are harmless and blameless as the sons of God and a people that glorify you in the earth. And God, we just ask it all in the lovely and precious name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.